Um, is it okay? Sounds, sounds good? All right. Um, first of all, I would like to thank the organizing committee to giving you a chance to present some of the work we've been doing about the with this. Uh, many of the people that was contributing to this work presented today are here with their name highlighted um, in the both faces, so you can go talk to them. Um, I think we're all agreeing that we're living in a golden age of exploring the exoplanetary system using the past and the current facility that we have, been heard, we have heard about in the past couple of days. And I think for studying uh, dust state debris this, we are currently passing the stage just by identifying infrared axis, as Ma has shown many of the things we can do. And we're right, right now in the stage trying to figure out exactly how this wonderful data tell us about the underlying planetary configuration and trying to identify some common features in debris structure that can be arise from more general effect other than the individual planet uh, configuration. So with that in mind, I think um, when we talk about debris this structure, and just like categorizing uh, the habitable zone around all the different kinds of stars, debris disk structures should be categorized in terms of their dust temperature. Um, there are actually two uh, very basic uh, advantages to doing this way. The first one is that uh, using the dust temperature to categorize the debris structure, the dust temperature is a very simple uh, function of the radial distance. So, and also, in an uh, optically seen uh, debris uh, uh, system, this temperature, if you use temperature rather than the physical distance, then the heating power of the star, like the different luminosity, different spectral type, can be taken out. So the common features, like the ice line in the debris disk, can be compared directly. So in my view, I think uh, for a debris disk, what we observe today using all the observation from the ground and space facility can be broadly uh, categorized in five zone and uh, with four different temperature. So here is the what five zone I was thinking about. The first one will have cold KB, Kappa Bell light dust that roughly around 50K that picking uh, mostly primarily in the far infrared, as Mark has shown that most of the debris disks have this kind of structure. And slightly closer in, we have some dust, what I call astral light zone, with a temperature around 150 K at the ice salination radius. So that's how I call warm belt. And some of the system will have terrestrial dust that emitting primarily roughly 300 K and with peak emission around 10 micron. And a few of the systems actually has been found that actually have very hot dust. The dust temperature is around the sublimation of the silicon grains, like around 1500 Ks, using the ground-based interferometry um, um, observation. And so this is a very hot dust that you can identify around some of the very small um, sample of the star. There's actually a poster uh, describing the sample they're doing. Um, so first, the two things I would like to uh, emphasize, I do not mean that all the debris that we observe today have all these five zones. Oh, I forgot the fifth zone. The fifth zone is what I call the disk halo, which is roughly outside uh, the, the four zones I was talking about. It's right here, it contains only a small grain, probably influenced by the radiation pr uh, pressure. So, First thing I would like to emphasize that I do not mean all the debris disks have this five zone. And I think majority of this that Mark has already shown that have this cold capable zone, the, the longer, lonely planetesimal bell. And in the later of the talk, I'm going to show you that some of them, this have this cold bell and also have this warm bell. So the variation between this, uh, second thing I would like to emphasize is that um, the, the temperature I'm saying here can be shipped depending on the different kind of spectral type. And so it's exactly depending on the stable location of the planetesimal bell and what kind of planet shackling that. So the temperature may, may shift a little bit. But generally speaking, the cold zone, the temperature 50K and the warm zone 150K, you, you can, uh, they are just well, the temperature difference is too, too big that they can be easily differentiated. Um, so, so 
the goal is trying to use the dust temperature we observe um, in all these debris trying to see what kind of um, a structure we can have. So here is a dust temperature distribution for roughly 300 debris disks. They all have infrared access emission. They observe with Spixer IIS and a lot of them compromise with a Spixer MIPS and Herschel 100 mi uh, micron photometry. So using those, we can determine the dust temperature for this system right pretty well. So here's the histogram for that 300 um, uh, debris disk. Because some of the uh, some fraction of the system uh, lack of the long work, long um, wavelength observation, so the exact number in this very cold end is unconstrained. But nevertheless, this plot basically show us that majority of this debris this we see is dominated by this cold capital zone, and amazingly, among roughly. Uh, a quarter of the system, <coughs> their dust SED required two temperature to fit the, their emission. So you have a dominant 50 micron, uh, showing as this red uh, um, histogram. So you have a 50K KB ozone, uh, a company with some of the warmer, warmer uh, astro light or um, terrestrial light disk. Um, so, what I'm going to talk about in the remaining of the talk, I'm just going to say that these two uh, bell systems account for roughly uh, 25 or 20 percent of the debris that we observe today. And I'm not planning all the disks that we show in the previous histogram are really two separate uh, planetesimal bell. But with the one that we have resolved this image at multiple wavelengths, we can easily differentiate. I can easily show you that those two are really two separate bells. And among those resolved this image, the most famous one that you have already heard a lot about in this conference is the HR8799 system. So here's the, our best image around the uh, debris around HR8799. By now, you already know that it has four massive planets. And this, this image at 24 micron is unresolved and is dominated by a, a material very close to the star. And at 70 micron, the disk is resolved as an inclined ring. And so basically, you know, it's, it's uh, slightly uh, tilted from the face down with an angle roughly 25 degree. And this is the uh, SED for combining all the different uh, up the data all together. So from the result image and the SED model, we can do combining all the data points we can roughly estimate the location of this bell. So for the, the warm component, it turns out to be 6 to 8 AU around here, what I call astro bell. And for the cold component, it's roughly 100 to 200 AU right here. And it's also an extended disk halo emission that you can see from here that's outside of, can be traced up to thousands AU. And most amazingly, this full massive planet attack in between these two bell. The inner the the innermost planet E right here is just right outside the outer uh, the, the astro bell and the outermost planet B is just right inside the uh, the outer cold Kappa bell. So those four massive planets occupy occupying this large gap between these two bell creating a mostly dust free zone. And also, uh, on Thursday, I think Paul Castle already told you that Formahal also have uh, these two distinct uh, uh, dust bell. So this is an image around the Formahal system you've probably seen so many times. A 24 micron, 70 micron, and the Alma A70 micron uh, with the other half filled by the HSD 0.6 micron. So besides this cold ring, there is also a central warm axis that was first identified using Spixer 24 micron data by Stephanie LL at 2004. So uh, using uh, IS spectrum showing this green line here in the SED, and uh, ma photometry measurement we can measure from all the image, we showed that this warm axis on result emission is consistent with a dust at a bare body temperature roughly 170K at the temperature at which that the ice sublimate. 
So this wall axis you see at prominently at the center here is an actual bell analog near the ice line. Okay, so showing the, the former have this, and one will have you wonder how about the figure this? Well, figure and former are often refer as the British twin. The reason is that they're both A type star. They locate roughly the same distance, less than eight parsecs away. And they are also at a similar age, roughly 500 million years old, with Vega probably slightly older. And most importantly, those two stars are the first few debris disks that are identified by IRA satellite 30 years ago. They have a very bright ring, uh, probably uh, from the particle that are rising in an uh, enhanced capable light zone. So now you know that Fomaha has an inner bell, inner astral bell. So you probably will wonder, is there an inner um, warm bell in the Vega disk as well? Well, unfortunately, um, the Spixer 24 micron data um, was severely saturated at the center. So back in 2005, when we first wrote our Vega paper, we didn't really know whether there's one component or not. But since then, we know much better about the, uh, to fix the data and also how exactly how the PSA behave. So we went back to reduce our uh, old fix 24 micron data and we found that after you take out the star, it does look like there is some astral uh, axis emission uh, at the center. So the next thing is that we dig out some of the uh, IRS spectrum center at the star and that's shown in this green light here. And after you take out the star, that's what's shown in the bottom here, it does look like there is an axis emission starting peeling up long world of 13 micron. So the next thing to see is whether Herschel see this unresolved uh, uh, one component. So the Herschel image is here, and the answer is yes. After you take out the star photosphere that's shown in this upper uh, image here, and there is uh, definitely an uh, unresolved um, point light uh, central component at the center that's probably best shown in the surface brightness cut in the bottom plot. So there is an uh, unresolved um, one component that's clearly separated from the cold bell that's most, uh, probably show up bestly with this, uh, the dashed line. So combining uh, the Spixer IS uh, spectroscopy data and the Herschel imaging data, and we show that the dust emission uh, is consistent with a bright body temperature roughly 170 K, again, just like the former hall. And with other SRV data that we convert that, Vega, just like former hall, also have an astral bell, an uh, astral bell analog near the water ice line. All right, so this is a uh, uh, final image about the Vega system. So we have 24 micron dominated uh, bright at the center for the astral bell. And this also show why it's 70 micron using the Herschel image. And this prominent bright KBO ring is around here. That's the KBO zone, roughly 90 to 120 AU. And this bright halo that also show up nicely at 70 micron, 100 micron, is roughly up to 800 AU. So the bottom plot here show you the uh, schematic illustration how the minor bodies like asteroid and KBO in the Vega system. So what does this minor body distribution tell us about the underlying uh, configuration? So the implication from this kind of two bell system, the first one is that the, la the gap between the inner and outer bell is pretty big. The orbital ratio is about roughly 10, consistent with the temperature you measure, uh, 150K in the warm bell and 50K in the outer cold bell. So there's a large gap in between that. Such a large dust-free zone probably between the, this bell may be maintained by one or multiple planet, planet mass object, and so through dynamical interaction. So you can use a very simple chaotic formula to estimate what kind of uh, object has to be in here to maintain this two bell. So this chaotic formula zone is basically, so the width of the chaotic zone, depending on the location of the planet A and the mass of the planet expressed as the ratio between the planet and the, the star. So we can use the boundary 
roughly boundary that we know the warm bell and the cold bell to estimate what kind of mass of the object have to have to maintain this large gap. So for one single object on the circular orbit, and using the roughly estimate the zone, uh, the, the bell location, we know that the object has to be more than 100 Jupiter mass. It's not really a planet. It's, it's a brown dome mass to maintain such a large gap. But you can say the object can be on eccentric orbit, yes. So we can have an eccentric case for uh, an object, and you can use, the, again, use the boundary to estimate the expected eccentricity to maintain this uh, large gap. And it turns out to be 0.8. It's very large. An object with a 0.8 eccentricity in the system is very likely to have a huge dynamic effect on the system, like forcing the uh, remaining planetesimal on an eccentric orbit. And we know that that's not what we observe in the Vega debris this because it's a very uh, smooth and cir circular ring. We know the eccentricity from the observation is less than 0.1. So in up furthermore, such a large, large mass object, the ground-based high contrast imaging should have found it already. I think the current limit is less than a, a couple of Jupiter mass in the Vega system. So that means this large gap is too large to be uh, explained by one single circular object. You probably need to have multiple uh, planets um, in the system to maintain this large gap. And most interestingly, we can compare the uh, Vegas minor body distribution with what we know about our own solar system that's showing on the top, and also the HR 8799 system showing on the bottom. Well, our sun, uh, unlike Vega and HR 8799, is a lower mass and less luminous star. So the astral bell is around 3 AU, consistent with dust roughly 150 K. And the Kuiper Belt is around 30, as our of 30 AU, consistent with dust roughly 50 K. And the orbital ratio, again, is 10. <coughs> and this large gap, we know we have four giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, and Neptune, maintain this large gap. Just like the system around HR 8799, this four massive planets occupying the gap. So it's very likely that there are multiple planets reside in the large gap in the Vega system as well. Um, the exact number, how many uh, planets you have to have to maintain the large gap is very uncertain, depending on the location of the, the planet and the mass of the planet. But I think uh, in order to maintain this large gap, we need at least two planets. We need one just right outside the, the astral bell to preventing any dust being brought out by um, stellar radiation, uh, then we need another one just right inside the cold Kuiper belt that preventing any dust being dragged into the system. So multiple planets is more likely to reside in this gap. Furthermore, I think we right now know that the giant planet are more likely to form uh, beyond the ice line. So it's beyond the astral belt here. So once this giant planet form, they are likely to migrate either inward or outward. So if a uh, giant planet outside the ice line this, uh, does migrate inward, it's very likely it will, uh, create, it will destroy any of the uh, object during the course of the migration. So the fact that the terrestrial planet will have terrestrial planet and astral bell in our solar system it's probably because our solar system doesn't have a hot Jupiter. So using the same analogy that I think um, the fact that the, the two bell system having an astral bell probably indicating a greater chance that they have a terrestrial planet inside there. So the blue dot in this two bell system are something to look forward to uh, for the future. So this is my last summary slide. I think the solar system uh, minor body uh, uh, distribution and the HRID 799 uh, really best illustrated how uh, the giant planet beyond the ice line affecting um, the minor body distribution and creating structure that we can see in debris disk imaging and spectral energy distribution. Um, although we don't have direct evidence saying that there's a planet has to be there, but 
this is uh, something that we should look forward to in the future. And these two bell systems are really the, the excellent signposts for multiple planets beyond the ice line. Thank you. All right, time for one question. Here, in the front, Jay. Uh, great talk, Kate. I, I think it's very interesting that the, the the planetary systems that we see that are most like, at least broadly like our own, are around two A stars. And I know that there are biases in the radial velocity and transit searches, which maybe have some biases against seeing things like our own, at least on short time scales. But are there any debris disk systems around G-type stars that have this kind yes, of archi thank you architecture? Yes, bringing out, I forgot to mention this excellent Eridani. It's a uh, K-type, it's a solar light star. It also has two bell. Is that the only one? Uh, there's a couple more that, uh, there's, there's many more. Like I say, there, there's 25% of the disks that have this two bell system. And many, many, many of them has been resolved either by uh, HST scatterlight or uh, Herschel or submillimeter. So there are many more. It's not just restricted to the A-type star. So that's why I'm saying we need to use dust temperature to categorize the structure rather than you know, physical distance because you can take out the dependency in the mass of the star. So I'm afraid we have to Sorry. move on, but let's thank Kate again. Thank you.